Is that scary up there, Peyton? That's what I would be thinking too. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, would you open your Bibles tonight to our text? We've been preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. We find ourselves tonight in chapter 6, and we'll take as our text this evening verse 9, 10, and 11. We are smack in the middle of the Apostle Paul dealing with problems in the church. Can you imagine that there could be problems in a New Testament church? Could you imagine that it's possible that people who profess to be Christians could act like something other than Christians? Could you imagine that there could be schisms in a body, rebellion, or going a different direction, or trying to change the direction of a church? Could you imagine that a church would have to deal with erring members? Could you imagine that sometimes a pastor would have to speak in correction and have to deal with situations? It happens. Paul was writing now, apart from Corinth, and he was challenging the church at Corinth about these schisms. In chapter 5 then, he began to deal with the sin of fornication that was present in the church. And he challenged the church that they needed to stop glorying in their being soft on sin. And they needed to deal directly with the issue at hand and discipline the brother who was sinning. And when they disciplined him, they needed to separate from him. Uh, they needed to make it clear that he was in the wrong and that he needed to repent. Now we come to chapter 6. And we dealt last week on Sunday evening with the first eight verses of that chapter, which talk about the problem of believers going to court against one another, suing one another at the court of law. And sadly, uh, this is an issue that was an issue in the church at Corinth and sometimes is still an issue in churches today. Uh, it is an issue of brotherly love. It is an issue of not yielding to one another. It is an issue of coming to church for the wrong reasons, which we spoke about last week. And when you come into the assembly with selfish purposes, you will always find that you will be disappointed, discouraged, and often offended. And that was what was going on. Brothers were going to law against one another. Instead of settling those matters within the church, they were going out to unsaved magistrates, hoping that those unsaved magistrates could settle those problems. And the Apostle Paul ended his conclusion of that matter in verse 8 by saying, Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Now, in verse 9, the Apostle Paul is going to deal with a parenthetical type of an issue which leads right back into, at the end of chapter 6, again, the issue of fornication or sexual uncleanness. Much of what he's going to deal with in verses 9, 10, and 11 also deals with the issue of sexual uncleanness. This evening, I'm going to, to be as discreet as I can while also uh, expositing the scriptures, which are very plain in these verses. And if you wonder why I am going to be so particular in looking at the words of this passage, it is because we live in a culture and a society that is very, very similar to the culture of Corinth. And the sins which are named in these verses are sins which are all around us in our society. It is reality that we are living in a world that has changed drastically since most of us were children. Uh, just in the last 10 years, we have seen almost a warp speed of change. And I believe that if Jesus tarries, the next 10 years are going to blow our mind for where this thing is going. Uh, I don't think it's going to get better, if you're curious about that. I don't believe that America is going to experience revival. I do believe that God could give us revival. But I'm afraid that we are too drunken on our riches, our covetousness, on our pleasure, we've gotten to the place where the most thing, or the biggest thing that people care about uh, in the social world or in the culture is uh, how much money will I pay in taxes and what will be my take home pay and will I be able to buy the toys that I want to buy? 
That's mostly what people are concerned about. Uh, we have much, much bigger issues in our country, and uh, there are a lot of things that are coming down the pike to Bible-believing churches like ours, which are going to, ha to change necessarily the way that we do ministry if the Lord tarries and He does not give us a little more space of time. I'm not saying that to frighten you tonight. I'm saying that because I believe it's the reality. Uh, we are already, uh, just, just real quickly before we dig into this passage tonight, we are already in a place where the state of Massachusetts is trying to apply gender discrimination laws to churches and is trying to say that churches will be restricted in what they can preach in the use of their bathrooms and these sorts of things. That's in Massachusetts, just a couple of states away. Uh, of course, uh, that, that hasn't gone into effect yet, and there are churches that are suing the state because of that. It will be interesting to see where that ends up because that is precedent setting. And if it passes in Massachusetts, you can be sure it will be coming to other states near you. And so our world is definitely changing I don't believe either one of our presidential candidates really cares about those things. And so uh, there are a lot of things that are happening in our world right now that are very troubling and at the same time very exciting because we say, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. But you know, this culture where the church at Corinth was located was wicked. It was ungodly. The, the city of Corinth was known... All throughout the, the world at that time, the ancient world, as a place where you went to have fun. It was a place where you went to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There was all manner of sexual uncleanness that was rampant in the city. And yet God in His grace had seen fit to raise up a Bible-preaching church of believers who had been born again by the grace of God in that wicked place. Isn't it amazing that God can work in very dark places? So don't be discouraged about that. But now there was some effect by the culture on the church at Corinth. And Paul was writing to remind them about who they were. Tonight I want to speak to you about what it means to be heirs to the kingdom of God. Paul is speaking about this problem that we need to consider tonight, and that is that not every person who professes to be saved is genuinely saved. It is possible for people to even be members of the church and not to have a genuine conversion experience. We ought to be tuned into that. Paul seems to me to be intimating that in this passage that there were some believers who had not, or, or some professing believers, excuse me, who had not experienced conversion and were still living in a way that was inconsistent with the Christian testimony, and he seems to be calling into question their salvation. Conversely, we also know that it is possible for people to be saved out of very, very deep sin and for God to completely transform their lives. And we find this in this passage that God delights in working in this way. If you're wondering tonight, does God still save people? Oh, He does. And there's lots and lots of sinners in the world around us that need to be saved. And we ought not to ever lose our burden for souls and our vision for God's ability to change lives. But now as we look at these verses tonight, we want to consider what it means to be heirs to the kingdom of God. Direct your attention with me, if you would, to chapter 6 and verse 9, where the Apostle Paul writes these words, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Lord, we desperately need your help tonight. 
I pray that you would help me to be emptied before you and filled with your Holy Spirit. Tonight, Father, I don't want to speak anything that would be hurtful. I don't want to speak anything that would be untrue. I don't want to speak anything that would be sensational. I just want to speak your truth from your word. I pray that you would help me tonight to be filled with the Spirit of God. I pray for those who are in the audience tonight that they would be listening with the filling of the Spirit of God and help us to think together in a way that would be scriptural and glorifying to you. Admonish us from your word tonight. If there would be anyone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would draw them to the cross of Calvary and help them to see that there is hope in Christ. Lord, be pleased to meet with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that Paul deals with in verse number 9 is a declaration that needs to be examined. He says there in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, Paul has an expectation. It comes through loud and clear in this question that he asked. The language that Paul is using here indicates to us that this is a fact that these believers should be very familiar with. Uh, for you and I, it's ridiculous to assume that these believers would not already know that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're here tonight and you're saved, it's expected that you would understand that unrighteous people are not going to inherit God's kingdom. Paul seems to have in mind the fact that he had clearly preached the gospel to these people at Corinth. After he had left, Apollos had clearly preached the gospel, and other gospel preachers had clearly labored there. This is a basic fact of the gospel, that those who are unrighteous are not pleasing to God and thus are not a part of his kingdom. Paul, in this question, is not so much asking a question as he is making a statement and saying that those who are unrighteous will not be heirs to the kingdom of God. And so to put this in terms that we understand very clearly tonight, Paul is stating that there is no hope that an unrighteous individual will go to heaven. You know, it's amazing to me, actually, how many people want nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with God during their life. They want nothing to do with his word. They want nothing to do with his ways. And they want nothing to do with his people. And then somehow they expect that they're going to go to heaven when they die. Do you know the sad truth is that even many professing Christians have nothing more to indicate that they are a Christian than the fact that they attend church occasionally or that perhaps they prayed a sinner's prayer at some point in the past. It's distressing to me how often I speak with individuals who assure me that they know that they are saved, and yet they have absolutely no testimony of conversion in their life. They have no indication in their life presently of being a part of the kingdom of God, which is what it means to be saved, and yet they are hoping one day to inherit the kingdom of heaven. They think that they can ignore God in this life and that God will call them to himself when they die. How sad it is. How sad it is that often at funerals, families and friends would like to hear that their loved one went to heaven. They want to be assured that their loved one went to heaven despite the fact that their loved one lived a wicked, ungodly, unrighteous life, never gave a thought to God ever in their life, except perhaps to blaspheme his name, and then suddenly at their funeral, they're a Christian. You see, Paul is writing to people who profess to be Christians, and he's stating what should be an obvious truth when he says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let's consider for a moment what it means to be unrighteous. You do know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
The truth is, those who are unrighteous are those who have violated the holy and just laws of God. They are those who are separated from God by virtue of their sin and their rebellion against God. But more, what Paul has in mind is that the unrighteous are not only those who have sinned against God, because certainly all of us could say tonight, I have sinned against God, I have broken God's law. But he also has in mind this unrighteous person is continuing in their sin. It is a continuing habit of their life. It is a continuing repetitive pattern of rebellion against God. There is no indication of them having been born again or of them having experienced what the Bible calls conversion or becoming a new creature in Jesus Christ. And Paul has this in mind when he says that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Literally what Paul means when he says they will not inherit the kingdom of God is that they are not rightful heirs to the glories of the kingdom of God. They are interlopers who suppose that somehow they'll be privileged to inherit the riches and glories of God's heavenly kingdom when God has no rule over their life right now. If God is not now your king, he will not make you a partaker in his kingdom after your death. Do you understand there is an element in the scriptures of lordship in salvation because salvation means uh, that we are born again of the Spirit of God and to be born again of the Spirit of God means to enter the kingdom of God and a kingdom has a ruler and his name is Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing and he's saying, don't you understand this basic truth this declaration that needs to be examined. It's sad to me, but we need to examine this declaration over and over again in modern day Christianity. There is much preaching that goes forth over the pulpits of American churches that is not gospel preaching. It does not call people to repentance. It is a very weak type of gospel presentation and we need to be careful that we're considering the declaration that God makes about what salvation is. Now, Paul makes this statement in the form of a question. And then in verse 9, he moves to a complementary thought. And now he's going to give us a description to evaluate. He starts by saying, be not deceived. In other words, be careful because there is something that is deceptive which seeks to overtake the thinking of humankind. There is a way of thinking that causes people to think that unrighteousness will yield them an eternal relationship with God. And now Paul is going to say, don't be deceived about this. Don't let Satan lie to you. Don't pretend that you're okay with God. Don't you know that those who are unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And then in verse 9 and 10, he gives us a long list of sins or trespasses against the law of God, which we should pay attention to. These are things that ought not to be marks of a believer. These are things that a believer ought not to engage in. These are things that are contrary to the kingdom of God. Now, he uses the word neither and also the word nor. And what Paul is doing is building a cumulative effect. He is not saying, if you have all of these things in your life, you're a really bad sinner and therefore you're not going to heaven. But rather, he is setting each one of these qualities apart from the rest and yet grouping them together as a list and he's saying every one of these is serious enough that God considers it unrighteousness. Now, we know from the Bible that unrighteousness is the violation of God's holy law. It is a trespass against that which God has decreed. And when Paul speaks in this way, you and I ought to be reminded that if we keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, we are guilty of all. 
And so we understand that we could never be saved by stopping all of this behavior. We can only be saved by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. But once a person is saved, there are th these things do not belong in the life of the believer. So let's consider these things. Let's consider these words very carefully. The first word in the list is the word fornicators. As we spoke about a couple of weeks ago in chapter 5, the word fornication, which is used in the New Testament, is a broad word, at least in the Greek language. Uh, the, the word that fornicators or fornication is translated from is the Greek word porneo, which has to do with any form of sexual sin or deviance. In the English language, the word fornicator is much more specific, and it tends to apply in the way that it is used in our King James Bible to sexual sin regarding those who have not yet gotten married. It is regarding the sins, the sexual sins, of those who are in a single state, uh, or that is, having not entered the covenant of marriage. When Paul uses this particular word, he is saying that fornicators are unrighteous. They are not a part of the kingdom of God. Someone who habitually involves themselves in fornication has great reason to doubt their salvation and to be concerned about whether, in fact, they do belong to God. I could suggest to you tonight that this takes in all sorts of sexual sin which are a common part of our culture tonight and which should trouble us because it is an indication of the wickedness that is present in our country at this time. I think of the pornography industry which brings in billions and billions and billions of dollars and the way that they do that is by hooking people and getting them addicted to their product so that they come back again and again. Now, in Corinth, fornication was a way of life. It was a part of the culture, even of the religious life, of the idolatry that took place there. There was a great deal of fornication that went along with it, which incidentally we find down through the ages has always been the case. Fornication and idolatry always go hand in hand. And so Paul says that fornication is wrong, it's unrighteous, it's not pleasing to God, it is harmful and offensive to God, even if it is normal in the culture. Now, I want to say tonight that we are in the habit sometimes as Christians of excusing things because they are common in our culture. Just because something is common in our culture does not mean that it is right with God. And so we should be very careful to prove all things, to use the scriptures to determine what we will uh, decide is right and what we will decide is wrong. So he mentions those who are fornicators. And the, the second word in the list is the word idolaters. Now I mentioned to you that idolatry goes along with sexual sin. It always has. And we can go all the way back in the scriptures to very early in human history and see the link between these two things. But we know that idolatry is worshiping anyone or anything other than God. This could take the form of bowing down to a graven image, or it could take the form of creating a God that is more after your liking than the God of the Bible. I'll suggest to you tonight that the more common form of idolatry in our country is not the bowing down to a graven image. Most people in our culture still see that as quite unusual and weird. However, there are many, many people who have fashioned a God of their own liking in their mind. And they have come up with a God that excuses their sin and allows them to do whatever they want to do and still go to heaven. This is, in the biblical definition, idolatry, and it is extremely offensive to God. As believers, we should be very careful that our thoughts about God are formed by the clear statement of Scripture and not by our preferences of what we would like God or not like God to do. You understand tonight that there are aspects of God's character 
which are very difficult for us to, to understand and that are also somewhat offensive to our sensibilities because we wonder how God could be that way or how God could do some of those things. And ultimately, it comes down to an issue of accepting or rejecting what the Bible says about who God is. Incidentally, the reason that we are often offended by things about God is because we have much too high a view of ourselves and much too low a view of God. And so the Apostle Paul says, idolatry does not have a place in the house of God. Now, the next word is the adulterers. We mentioned fornication as sexual sin pertaining particularly to those who are in an unmarried state. Adultery is sexual sin that pertains primarily to those who are in a married state. An adulterer is someone who is unfaithful to their marriage vows. This is someone who goes outside the bounds of their marriage relationship to seek intimacy and sexual pleasure of any kind. And so if you're married and you're looking for pleasure and satisfaction somewhere besides in the marriage relationship which you entered into with a covenant promise, then you are in a place of being unrighteous. You are behaving in a way which is not consistent with the scriptures. It's amazing how often people will excuse adultery and will say, well... You just have to understand how difficult their situation was. I think that God, when he gave us his holy law, could imagine how difficult situations could be and that he, in his wisdom, gave us his holy law for a good purpose. And we shouldn't seek to twist his law to somehow make a provision for the flesh in our own lives. Now he goes on in verse number 9. He's covered those who are fornicators and those who are idolaters and those who are adulterers. And now he speaks about those who are described as effeminate. Now, this is an interesting word. And in the context, it seems to indicate men who act like women. And specifically, what he seems to be speaking about is the aspect of sexual uncleanness that could be indicated by this word. This is not just a man who is more sensitive or more soft-spoken. That's not what he's referring to. Sometimes we use the word effeminate in that way. That's not what Paul is speaking about. Paul is actually speaking about a man who, for some sense of pleasure, dresses and acts like a woman. Do you know the sins of our age are actually quite ancient? It's not as if there's something new that we're experiencing in this generation. This was something that went on in the city of Corinth. Sometimes we scratch our head and we think, how could these things be? The reason these things are is because of man's sin and man's rebellion against God. And so Paul addresses this and he says those who are effeminate are an offense to God. They are unrighteous. Don't let anyone tell you any differently. Don't let anyone seem to indicate or suggest that this is okay with God. It's not okay. This issue of gender confusion is exactly that. It's confusion. It is, and God is not the author of confusion. God is not the one who has introduced that confusion. In a message that I preached some weeks ago, I addressed this issue and I encouraged our church family to think scripturally about this because as the age marches along, I believe that it will get more and more confusing in the days ahead. Paul addresses this and he says, this is unrighteous behavior. This is ungodly. The, the very next phrase is complementary to the one which we just spoke about. Abusers of themselves with mankind. Undoubtedly, this phrase refers to the sin of unnatural affection, which is what the Bible calls it. Uh, the Bible doesn't call it homosexuality. That is a carnal worldly term for wicked behavior. The Bible calls it unnatural affection. It calls it going against that which nature intended. Romans 1.27 says, And likewise also the men 
leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. You do understand that this kind of behavior is all around us in the world today. I personally have been propositioned by gay men, inviting me to come and spend time with them. That is very troubling to me. Uh, at the time, I was a young man. Uh, I was not married at that time, and I was approached and was asked to come and spend time in this way. This is ungodly and unrighteous. This is something that is not pleasing to the Lord. And you say, uh, this sort of stuff, uh, I, I'm very thankful that that was at least out in the world, because we would expect that sort of thing in the world. That was out and about in the world. But you know, the sad thing is when we see this sort of behavior coming into places that call themselves churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is becoming very popular today. And it is amazing to me how many so-called churches and so-called preachers are seeking to change what the scriptures say to somehow indicate that there is nothing wrong with the sin of unnatural affection. Many so-called churches today are saying that Jesus never preached against this sin and that the New Testament does not forbid this behavior. In doing so, they conveniently sidestep verses like the one that we're considering tonight. God still thinks it's sin. God still holds it in an opinion of unrighteousness and it ought not to be named among the people of God. Then he goes on. Uh, most of those sins dealt with sexuality and with the carnal nature that is drawn to these types of sins. Now he goes on to some other sins which, which also ought not to be characteristics of the believer's life. He uses the word thieves, nor thieves. A thief is someone who takes something that doesn't belong to him. And no matter how you excuse it, thievery or stealing is unrighteous and offensive to God. But sadly, there are some believers who would say, well, a little bit of thieving is not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. It is a problem in the believer's life, and we ought to be careful not to excuse this type of sin. We ought to be careful in our own life uh, to be very honest and to be very careful that we are not somehow uh, taking something that doesn't belong to us. The next word is the word covetous. If there is a sin which is a mark of our culture and of our age, it is the sin of covetousness. Don't let anyone tell you that the lack of money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You will read secular authors who will tell you, uh, you can go ahead and love money, it's okay. You can't love money because it gets out of control. Now, I'm thankful that God can certainly bless his people with material resources, but we ought to be so cautious that we don't become covetous. When you're driven by your desire for things, when the love of money becomes your driving passion, you are covetous. I would say this could be a sin which we could characterize as a besetting sin of many American Christians. And so God says, be careful of covetousness. That type of behavior is not the characteristic of a Christian. Then he uses the word drunkards. And when he uses the word drunkards, most of us think of alcohol or wine, alcoholic beverage. You know, it's bewildering to me that so many people today are trying to establish a different standard than what God's word has in this area. And they're saying, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, you can go ahead and imbibe. You can enjoy some alcoholic beverages. After all, Jesus turned the water into wine and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and they conveniently skip over so many verses in the Bible which forbid the use of alcoholic beverages and also encourage us to be careful not to tempt a brother or sister or any person with that sort of a substance. But I believe that Paul has in mind also not just alcoholic beverages, but he has in mind other things that are prevalent in our society today, like cocaine and marijuana, 
and heroin and on and on we could go, methamphetamines and all of these abuses, even of prescription drugs in our culture today, which are so prevalent. And he says, don't allow yourself as a Christian to be brought under the control of some other substance. He tells us in the book of Ephesians, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what we ought to uh, what we ought to plan is that we could be filled with the Spirit and to avoid these other things. By the way, if I get to heaven and God says, you shouldn't have preached against alcohol, it was okay for people to drink, then I'm willing to accept that reproof from the Lord. But I really don't believe that I'm wrong in that. I believe the Scriptures are very clear that it is wrong to imbibe. It is wrong and it is foolish and it will destroy your life. Then he goes on and he says, nor revilers. A reviler is someone who is abusive. It's someone who uses angry language to manipulate and to control others. Sadly, this is prevalent in our society. <clears throat> I'm not going to say what I was going to say. In God's eyes, this is wicked sin. Reviling. You ought to be careful. Be careful about the speech that you use. Be careful how you speak to your family members. Fathers, be careful how you speak to your children. Uh, be careful how you speak to others that are around you. Revilers, those who learn to manipulate with their words, certainly get their way sometimes, but in the end, they don't win. God is keeping the record books, and revilers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Extortioners, that's the last word that he uses in this list. And an extortioner is someone who tries to twist or wrestle anything away from another person by force or trickery. It has in mind particularly getting money. And so he says a believer ought not to be involved in extortion. Uh, extortion also involves using authority in an unauthorized manner to reward oneself by taking advantage of others. And authority is a very serious thing. There's a responsibility to those who are given authority, and they will answer to God for how they wield that authority. The sad truth is that many people who have authority will use that authority to somehow extort others or get something for themselves. Evidently, this behavior was common in the city of Corinth, and the Apostle Paul said, this is not righteous, this is not the type of behavior that you should be engaging in. Now, Paul repeats in, the, in verse number 10 the previous statement to make sure that we understand. He says, these individuals uh, shall not, uh, the implication is in the negative, shall inherit the kingdom of God. They won't. Uh, if, if you're in the custom of behaving in this manner, then stop assuring yourself that you have salvation because there's something desperately wrong in your life. Paul wants us to understand that there ought to be a difference when a person gets saved. The individuals who are listed above are trespassers of God's righteous law, and they're guilty before God, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Furthermore, this type of behavior ought not to be tolerated within the Lord's church. Now then, he comes to verse 11, and there's a third point which he brings to our attention. And this is a difference to expect. We've been hinting at this all along through the message. And so we need to understand that inherent in this passage is an understanding that though there is forgiveness with the Lord, the previous unrighteous behavior is not appropriate for those who have been forgiven and who have become a part of the kingdom of God. Now, Paul says this in verse 11, and this is really a victorious verse because he's been talking about that which is the bad news before this. This is the characteristic of those who are rebels against God. And in verse 11, the apostle Paul says, and such were some of you. Now, consider the import and the impact of that statement. I have heard people say this foolish statement. People who engage in unnatural affection cannot be saved. I believe the scriptures are very clear that that is inaccurate. 
Because here, the Apostle Paul says, and such were some of you. I believe that people who get caught up in all sorts of gross sin that we find very difficult to excuse or to forgive, God says that it's possible to be forgiven. Now, this is really good news because if you find your description in the verses previous to verse 11, it means that there is hope for you. It means that God is able to forgive. It means that God is able to change. Paul is clearly pointing out that there were those in the church at Corinth who had once been involved in all of the sins that were mentioned previously, and now they were no longer involved in those sins. Now they had been set free from the bondage and the shackles of sin. Understand this with me tonight. God can and God does save sinners. Don't ever look at a sinner and say, too far gone, no hope for them. There's no chance that they'll ever get saved. God just might surprise you. God might allow you to see a little touch of how amazing his grace is. By the way, how hypocritical of us to think that God could save us, but that other people are somehow worse sinners and God's grace is not sufficient for them. Now, I don't deny that the deeper a person goes into sin, the more the deception of sin addles their brain and keeps them from coming to the knowledge of the truth. But don't underestimate the power of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. God can save sinners. And Paul says, such were some of you. I believe that if we were to go around the room tonight, we could find that there are many people in this auditorium this evening who could identify with the previous description and say, that's what I was before Christ met me. That's what I was before I was born again. But praise God, it's in the past tense. It is no more. Uh, it's not something that I participate in anymore. Now, Paul is not either indicating that it is impossible for a believer to fall into sin again. Rather, he's speaking about that which is a characteristic or a habit of life. And he says, God has saved some of you at the church of Corinth, and you used to be like this, and you're not like that anymore. And such were some of you, that's what you were. Don't you love the next word? But, but, praise God for that conjunction Amen. that changes the whole picture. Sin needn't be hopeless. Sin needn't be a, 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 a servitor. But we needn't be slaves to sin. God can set us free. And now Paul says there is an expectation that when you have been saved... There ought to be a difference in your life. God does not save you so that you can continue in the bondage of sin. God saves you so that you can demonstrate his great power to set you free. But, I love that word. And such were some of you, but, and then now notice several things that Paul says ye are washed. Do you know what it means to be washed? It means you're clean. It means the filthiness is gone. It means that it's forgotten. Last night at supper, we were eating, and at the end of supper, my wife picked up Caleb out of his seat, and she said, oh, to put it delicately, <clears throat> Caleb had an accident. And it was such that Caleb needed to go straight to the bathroom. And so I took Caleb <laughs> at arm's length. I deposited him in the bathtub, whereupon I removed his clothing, and we got the water and the soap, and we cleaned Caleb up. But you know, after he had a bath, he was clean. After he had a bath, I didn't say, no, Caleb, you can't sit on my lap. You were dirty. 
because he wasn't dirty anymore. He was clean. He had been washed. Uh, the, the defilement was gone. It was no longer there. Uh, there was no evidence of it anymore. Do you know tonight, brethren, the sins that you committed one time, if you are saved, those sins and those transgressions have been washed away by the most powerful cleansing agent that this universe has ever seen, the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. There is no sense in which those sins will ever be held against you again. What is in the past is under the blood, and it'll never be held against you in an account. Aren't you thankful? Ye are washed. Then he says, ye are sanctified. Praise God for the washing of the water of the word. You see, when you were washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins were forgiven. But then begins a process in your life, which the Bible calls sanctification. It means to make something holy or hallowed or set apart for a special purpose. And you know the truth of the matter is, that is an ongoing process in the believer's life. There is a truth that for you and I, when we got saved, we were forgiven of all our sin, but we were not freed from our sin in the sense that we don't anticipate that we will be without sin until we die. Now, I wish that were the case. We're looking forward to the day, and, you know, every time you feel an ache in your body and sore muscles and the realization that you're getting older and you're not as strong as you used to be and that you're not healing as quickly as you used to, that's just the body. That's just your earthly temple groaning for redemption and reminding you that there's coming a time when you will be completely free from the presence of sin. The process of sanctification is God setting us free from sin, usually one sin at a time. I've noticed this, that oftentimes when people get saved, there will be some obvious things that will fall away. There will be some things that God will deliver them from. And then God goes to work. Now be careful that you don't look at another person who professes to be saved and say, now when I got saved, God took that away from me and I don't understand why he's not taking it away from you. Because we could just as easily look at you and say, you know, when God saved me, he took away my temper, and I don't know why he didn't take yours away. Or when, when God saved me, God took away... You fill in the blank, right? Isn't it interesting how we tend to be dismissive of our sin and very accusative of someone else's sin? Now, we ought to be careful of our testimony, but we also ought to understand that God is working on us. One of the marks of a believer is the ongoing work of God in their life, making them different than what they used to be. If you're saved, you should be able to look back in your life from the time that you trusted Christ until the present day. You should be able to see a steady progression, be it with fits and starts, stumblings, yes, but progress in your life that is towards the image of Christ from what you used to be to what you will be. Sanctification is obvious in a person's life when they're saved because the Holy Spirit of God makes them uncomfortable about sin. The Holy Spirit of God works in their life to transform them. Sanctification is a pursuit and a process that you and I cooperate with God in. And sanctification is a reality for those who have been saved. So he says, you've been washed, and can you, can you understand this? You're being washed. So the idea is that God is continuing to clean your life up and make you more like Christ if you're truly a believer. Then the third phrase that he uses is, ye are justified. Now the word justified is the declaration of God concerning your position before Him. Previously, before you met Christ, you were condemned because of your sin. 
But by faith you have been justified in the eyes of God, having all the righteousness of God attributed to you. And when God sees you, he does not see your failures. He does not see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a glorious truth. The principle of justification is something that should make our hearts thrill if we are truly saved. So Paul says, ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. The implication is, if you're washed and you're sanctified and you're justified, you're not going to be comfortable in that old filth. You're not going to be comfortable in the life where Christ found you. You're not going to easily be able to go back to that sin. Now notice a couple of other Expl explanatory phrases that he uses in verse number 11. He says, we're washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you know tonight, if you've been washed and sanctified and justified, this is not something that you do for yourself. This is something that is done for you because of the strength of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. It is all of grace and not of merit. It is all dependent on Jesus Christ, and we ought to be so thankful for His grace. When by faith you appropriate the sacrifice of Christ in your place, you can experience what it is to be washed and sanctified and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, ultimately, these things happen because of the indwelling ministry of the Spirit of God. When a person believes the gospel, repenting of their sin, they are born again by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God births them anew and gives them life where before there was death or separation from God. Salvation and sanctification all depend on the work of the Spirit of God within us, Him giving us new life and growing us in Him. Now, I want you to consider this with me tonight. If the Spirit of God is in you because you've been washed, justified, sanctified, then there ought to be a difference in your life. Do you agree with that? Right. Now, Paul is going to build on this principle in the balance of the book. He's going to bring us back to this principle in just a little bit and remind us of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I find it very difficult to believe that a person who is living habitually in the types of sin that is described in verses 9 and 10 can have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Because the Holy Spirit of God is not going to be pleased if you are dwelling in that kind of sin. He is going to be grieving you. He is going to be chastising you. He is going to be trying to get your attention. A person who says... I'm a Christian, and you know, I prayed a prayer way back there when I was a kid, and then I lived in rebellion for 35 years, and I did all this stuff, and it never bothered me. Here's what I say to them. I find it very unlikely that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Very unlikely. I suppose I could be wrong, and you know, everybody wants to trot out the outlier. Everybody says, well, you know, Lot vexed his righteous soul daily in Sodom and Gomorrah. And my answer to that is, why would you want to be like Lot? The only way that we know Lot is saved is because God told us so. I suppose there may be people who get to heaven, as we like to say, by the skin of their teeth. And we look at them and think, wow, you were saved? That's amazing. I, I never knew it. But I rather think those are going to be the exceptions rather than the rule. I wouldn't stake my eternity. I wouldn't stake my eternity on a profession of faith that can't get me to church to get me to heaven. Do you see what I'm saying? I would be very cautious about that. This is the work of the Spirit of God. I believe the Spirit of God is very powerful. I personally have experienced his indwelling ministry. I personally know what it is like to be rebuked by him. And believe me, he can rebuke. Yes. 
He can let you know when things aren't right. He can probe your conscience and leave you in a place of understanding very clearly that what you just did was not pleasing to the Lord. When I see someone who seems not to have that spirit, Despite all other protestations, I do have concerns about the validity of their salvation experience. This seems to be what Paul is writing about. He is writing to people who are by and large true believers. And he is saying, you're different. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. But now there are some people who are in the church, who are participating in this behavior that marked the life of those who are in the church before they met Christ. Why is this being tolerated? Why is this being allowed? Why isn't anyone challenging them uh, that this sort of behavior is not pleasing to the Lord? You know, tonight, when we think about this truth of being heirs to the kingdom, and that's a glorious promise, by the way, the promise of God that one day we, will, we are joint heirs with Christ. That one day we will share in the riches of God's heavenly kingdom. That we will reign with Christ. This is a wonderful truth and not something to be dismissed quickly. But sadly, there are many people who have a hope of heaven with an unchanged life. They have a misplaced hope of heaven, thinking that perhaps their church attendance, their little bit of religion, their good works are going to get them in good favor with God. And we need to be reminded tonight that we need to be thoroughly washed. We need to be declared as just when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Your own righteousness will not suffice when you stand before God. You'll need Christ's righteousness to make it into heaven. How about you tonight? Have you been washed? Are you being sanctified? Have you been justified? Tonight, do you remember what you once were? Do you remember where Christ found you? And have you given thanks to God for the salvation that he has brought in your life? And such were some of you. Praise God for the past tense and the change that Christ has wrought in our lives. Tonight, we want to worship him for that. We want to praise him. And we also want to give you an opportunity to be born again if you have never trusted in Christ as your own Lord and Savior. Would you stand with me tonight? And I'm going to ask the musicians to come. And I'm just going to ask them to play the invitation hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. It could be tonight that God has spoken to your heart. It could be this evening that you need to come and just thank the Lord for how he's changed you and the, the salvation that he's brought into your life. It could be tonight that you need to come and bow your knee to the kingship of Jesus Christ you need to submit yourself to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in your place and by faith accept and appropriate his death on the cross for you. If you need some help from the scriptures, we'd be glad to help you tonight. But we want to give you an opportunity tonight, if God has spoken to your heart, to come and talk to the Lord. As the musicians begin to play the invitation hymn, if God's spoken to your heart, you come. You can certainly do business with God there in your seat but we want to encourage you tonight to be honest before God and to let God have his way.